Thank you, Eric. I'd also like to pay my respects to the elders, past and present, of this land we are on today. I particularly want to thank you, obviously, the Whitlam Institute and Gilbert and Tobin, working together in partnership to bring us this event to one of our preeminent jurists to come and speak with us today. The Honourable Michael Kirby um, is one of the few people, really, we can say the statement, he doesn't need a formal introduction. I think we're all waiting to hear how the Whitlam transformative vision and international law seen through the eyes, as said, of one of our preeminent judges. Please welcome the Honourable Michael Kirby. Thank you. I too should start with a sincere acknowledgement of the traditional custodians of the land not an insincere or perfunctory one, but one that acknowledges the wrongs that have been done and that we are determined as a country to right those wrongs and wrongs to all people in this uh, fair continent. I also acknowledge the members of the Whitlam family who are here. Uh, the uh, Lord Protector can't be here tonight, but I'm sure he is following this probably on a podcast and he's going to correct all of my uh, phraseology if not some of my facts. So I'll be looking forward to that. I uh, acknowledge the University of Western Sydney uh, which is a wonderful university with a great diverse range of programs and the Vice-Chancellor who is here tonight, Professor Janice Reid, uh, and we're very glad that you're doing well, Michael, Professor Michael Adams. And it's good that you share your perspective. This is how we get to truth, by people sharing uh, the varieties of life and life's experience. So we're all with you and we all hope that everything continues to go well. Uh, Jason Donnelly, who is here, has already been mentioned twice, but I should mention him a third time. In fact, stand up, Jason Donnelly. <laughs> Jason Donnelly, a very good <laughs> First Class Honours and University Medal. Uh, his predecessor, First Class Honours and University Medal, um, was Leonie Young, who was another graduate of UWS, who was the first uh, associate in the High Court from UWS. She worked for me. She was wonderful, and as we speak, she's over in Harvard doing exams. Uh, she's a, a wonderful graduate, uh, and Jason is too, and I owe a tremendous lot for the research that Jason gathered together uh, in this lecture tonight. Thirty years ago, almost exactly, I gave a lecture uh, on the subject Whitlam as law reformer, uh, and uh, the lecture reviewed the work that Gough Whitlam had done in opposition and in government uh, for law reform in Australia, including the establishment of the Australian Law Reform Commission, of which uh, I became the first chairman. And at the end of my lecture, uh, in a sort of classical allusion, which I thought would uh, add a certain style to the uh, oral delivery of the lecture, I said that through his career, like a thread of Ariadne, had been spun an interest in the law and law reform. Mr Whitlam then rose and quick as a flash, without any warning of what I had said, uh, he gave a very typical Whitlam intervention. What the learned judge failed to disclose <laughs> was that that thread of Ariadne was leading me to be consumed by the Minotaur. <laughs> well, here we are again to honour another facet of the life of uh, Edward Gough Whitlam, uh, the, his work in international law and international treaties, uh, and it's my privilege to deliver the 2010 Whitlam Lecture. Probably the biggest change in the law in my lifetime has been to see the vastly increased impact of international law on Australia's domestic law. This includes international human rights law. 
A world of princes and empires has been replaced by a world of trade and of shared commitments, however imperfectly those commitments are as yet realised. This change is brought about as a response to many forces. Reactions to the Second World War, outcomes of new technology, the proliferation of global challenges, the replacement of the imperial age by a time in which the people of the world could increasingly realise their rights and their shared destiny. Gough Whitlam has been a child of these global changes, but he's also contributed to them and he's been in sympathy with them and he's helped to shape Australia's responses to them. He didn't alone fashion Australia's adjustment to the new age, but his contribution was very great, as I intend to show. In this lecture, I want to explore a particular aspect of his remarkable career. I'll examine his commitment to changing Australia's perception of itself as a participant in international affairs, and especially in the international forces that were expressed in international law. I intend to explore Australia's growing engagement with international treaty law under the Whitlam government and the use of international law that followed the development of Australia's domestic law. I'll conclude with some reflections on Gough Whitlam and his father Fred Whitlam, who earlier also played a part in Australia's engagement with international law. And finally, I'll offer a few evaluative conclusions, ending the whole with an affectionate tribute to, to affection, affectionate tribute to the man whose restless spirit helped Australians to adjust to a new national and international reality and to the challenges and opportunity that that reality provided. When he was sworn as Prime Minister on the 5th of December 1972, Whitlam said of his newly elected government, quote, Our thinking is towards a more independent Australian stance in international affairs and towards an Australia which will be less militarily oriented and not open to suggestions of racism, an Australia which will enjoy a growing standard as a distinctive, tolerant, cooperative and well-regarded nation, not only in the Asia-Pacific region but in the world at large, end of quote. Whitlam saw international law as an essential component of efforts to avoid conflict, resolve disputes and restructure international relations. It was on this basis, in part, that the Whitlam government embarked on a vigorous program of ratifying international treaties. Under the Whitlam government, over 133 international treaties entered into force for this country, uh, including 26 exchanges of notes, 32 bilateral agreements, 16 multilateral agreements, 17 protocols, 8 international statutes, 34 treaties and conventions. Commenting on the international engagement of his government, Whitlam said, quote, We've done a great deal more, I believe, than all previous governments. We've communicated to the world our commitment to international law and our eagerness to contribute to cooperative endeavours. We've displayed a breadth of legal skills and Australia has come to be regarded as an independent voice. Under Whitlam, three treaties were ratified specifically relating to criminal law. Most of these dealt with aspects of extradition. Three important treaties on environmental concern and five treaties dealing with nuclear power and weaponry entered into force under the Whitlam government. In opposition, Whitlam had suggested that the election that returned the coalition to government in 1969 had indicated that the Australian people wanted their government to sign the Treaty on Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons, the NPT. On that treaty, the, Whit the Gorton government had been prevaricating. But on winning government, on the 2nd of December 72, Whitlam, without delay, secured Australia's ratification of the NPT and it entered into force on the 23rd of January 1973, just seven weeks later. The NPT is an important international treaty that represents the only binding commitment of a multilateral treaty to the goal of securing disarmament by the nuclear weapon states. <coughs> 